Okay, as we move on, we've been through the idea of uh, Bitcoin as a, a currency and looking at protocol layers which can be built on top and leverage the strength of the Bitcoin network. And I think Louis briefly mentioned altcoins in his uh, presentation. Uh, there's already 480 three similar currencies uh, based on the same principle. Um, lots of them are pretty worthless, um, just made up for fun. Some of them kind of, they're, they're, the, the idea is they're looking for, to make improvements where people see weaknesses in the original design of Bitcoin and uh, maybe solve some of the problems themselves. Uh, some people may supersede Bitcoin if, um, if imp you know, the so-called improvements actually take off and gain some kind of following. Um, some people see them potentially they're just a nursery uh, for testing out new solutions and that in the future Bitcoin could actually incorporate some of these new designs itself um, if the whole network decides it wants to kind of uh, a, a amend the protocol in some way. So these all operate separately from Bitcoin um, and as we mentioned earlier as well different use cases um, and there's a project underway that has been from the start of the year called Ethereum and I will hand over to let Stefan describe Ethereum to you. Thank you, we're not an altcoin. Uh, hi, I'm Stefan. I'm the CCO and, uh, for Ethereum and I'm responsible for a little London hub. Um, so what is Ethereum? Uh, spoiler alert, it's the web without the servers. So the first question uh, I think we need to ask ourselves is why, why Ethereum? Why did we spend the last nine months building this thing, spending pretty much every waking hour building this platform? Um, the f first one, I suppose, is think about what happens when you log on to Facebook. Um, anybody here has got a Facebook account? Yeah, you just don't, I mean, Nikki admits it, but nobody else does, right? I have a Facebook account too, but, you know, I admit it. Um, what, when you connect to Facebook, you basically request permission from a server that's located God knows where uh, to connect at, and to access information about what's going on with your friends, your friends. And every time, in fact, you take an action on that, on that Facebook application, you re-request um, Again, the permission to know what's going on, to post a message to your friend, to upload a picture, to tag someone, etc. And the only time you use the only thing that's actually under your control, which is your computer, the hardware that's in your possession, is to uh, display information. And we think that's a fundamentally broken model. Um, it's a model, in fact, that's found everywhere. When you do online banking, you request permission to know what's going on with your money, and you put your trust into centralized authorities um, that have full control over your funds, your personal information, and so on and so forth. So take Dropbox, for example. I'm sure more people will admit they use Dropbox than Facebook here. Um, if you use Dropbox, you trust the Dropbox programmer to all wake up on the right side of the bed, to be in a good mood, to not make any mistake, to operate under a model where they're regulated by some auditor or, or something of the sort, and that um, they won't sell your information to the NSA or to third parties. Um, and I think some iCloud users will have something to say about that, uh, especially recently with Jennifer Lawrence and so on in particular. Um, or the JP Morgan customers, which recently there was a huge leak of data, about 81 million, I believe, uh, per, a piece of personal data were, were leaked. So we think that's broken. Um, the other thing where that applies to is not just uh, users, it applies to developers. So if there's developers in this room and you try to submit an application to the Apple App Store, you have to pay, first of all, you have to ask permission to get on the App Store, and then they can pull you out anytime they feel like it. Um, we think that's a broken model. Um, and finally, when you use a centralized service, uh, or when you operate a centralized service, I should say, you offer a very small surface of attack to potential hackers. So hackers have this one little entry point. They can go, they can hack into it, they can use what's called DDoS attack, denial of service attack, to go and shut you down, and that hap has happened over and over and over again in the last few years. So. Um, Ethereum is an open source platform to build and distribute decentralized applications. They're applications without middlemen. Um, it can be bi used to build just about anything. It's not limited to finance. It can be social sites, financial systems, obviously, voting mechanism, you name it, you can build it. Uh, it's 100%, 100% sorry, peer to peer. It's censorship proof. Uh, all communications are encrypted end to end. And it's deep packet inspection proof, so your data is safe from prying eyes. Um, it's using the same uh, blockchain technology that has been described to you by, uh, very well by Louis, uh, meaning that uh, it's also censorship proof because nobody can go and modify the information after the fact as to the results of what the programs are running on, a, on our blockchains are. And of course, as a user, you stay in control of your funds and your personal information at all times. Um, 
how do you build application on Ethereum? So I don't think there's many developers here, but you're probably familiar with the technology that you can use on Ethereum. You, you use HTML and JavaScript, which is the building blocks of the web, to build the front end. So nothing changed. You can say the, the same framework, the same content distribution network that your web developers are using today. And the back end is a little bit different, but not completely uh, unfamiliar. Python, Lisp, or Go, those are very similar uh, languages uh, than what you would find uh, in web framework. Uh, I'm not here to ask you for money. We've raised $12 million uh, in a crowd sale uh, recently. I always say that because people think I'm asking for money. I'm not. Um, how does it work? Um, again, blockchain technology, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. It's been explained very well by Louis earlier. What's different here for Ethereum is that we have this thing called contracts. They're little pieces of code, little programs, if you will, and they can talk to other contracts. They can send and receive transaction funds. Um, they can create new contracts, and they can also kill themselves with something called suicide. Um, <laughs> It's completely based on a zero infrastructure model. So there's absolutely no servers anywhere that are actually holding this, uh, these, these websites, these decentralized websites, if you will. It's all based on blockchain technology. And of course, by being based on blockchain technology, it's imper impervious to denial of service attacks. Use cases, anything. Um, it's a programming language. You can think it, you can build it. It's simple as that. So if what can be built in Java, C++, C Sharp, .NET, whatever, you name it, it can be built on our platform. Uh, but there's a few uh, applications that are particularly well suited for uh, something like Ethereum. So here we have um, a company called airlock.me. Uh, it's a startup that's using our platform to build a decentralized locking mechanism and potentially a decentralized Airbnb. At the back here, if you can see it, there's a little door. The door is talking to a Raspberry Pi that's sitting in front of this gentleman here. The Raspberry Pi speaks Ethereum and it's telling the door if somebody has the right to open it or not based on the public key infrastructure that's deployed on our network. So if you have purchased the room for the night, or if you have the right to rent this car, or if you have the right to access this locker, it will let you in, and that's guaranteed by the blockchain technology, not to have been obviously falsified. It's applicable to all sorts of things, digital art, smart property. Um, you have cars now that have automated lock systems, like the Tesla, for example. And it's very, uh, very attractive to a lot of companies, including IBM, which recently uh, kindly <laughs> forked Ethereum. Uh, Paul Brody is the head of mobile innovation for IBM, and they've uh, cloned our, our code to build a proof of concept that they're going to demonstrate at the CES in January. Um, the other thing that Ethereum is quite applicable for is removing the middleman. Um, so if you have a distributed ledger that's completely secure um, and not relying on trust of central authority to issue uh, data, it's the perfect environment to issue tokens, tokens of values, like those meta coins or altcoins that uh, Paul was talking about earlier. So where Kickstarter offers you free t-shirts when you purchase um, a pre-order product on their platform, uh, uh, you could actually issue instead shares, shares into the company that you want to invest into. Um, and that's, I think, a revolutionary concept in itself. Um, I'll sk skip through that, but if you can issue tokens for anything, you can issue tokens for node incentivization, like mesh networking, for example, distributed Wi-Fi, etc. Um, if you're familiar with the BOINT program, which is a sort of a charity um, uh, sort of giveaway your CPU power to find solutions to big uh, problems in humanity, including cancer through folding at home. There's even SETI at home to find little aliens. Uh, <laughs> um, you could reward those users with those tokens of value rather than just um, points, which are a little bit meaningless. Uh, and they could exchange those points for other things. So if somebody got rewarded for actions in the physical world, for example, by, say, a Foursquare or a Facebook check-in, they could be trading those points for uh, folding at home points or ASDA points or Walmart points or whatever type of uh, loyalty program you can think of. Another one I quite like, and we've been contacted by quite a lot of energy companies, especially in Europe, um, we're trying to become more and more operators of the energy grid rather than producers. So if you can produce energy at home through solar panels, set it back to the grid, what better way to do so than issuing coins, so to speak, or tokens, uh, when somebody, say, produce one megawatt of clean energy at home. 
And uh, more probably relevant to this audience, uh, one concept I'm particularly interested in is this idea of bringing reputation back to finance. If you go to Kenya, there's this concept of chamas. Um, there are groups of six or seven individuals that vouch for the eighth individual as being a good individual that will pay the loan back. And the reason why they have that is because they have no collateral. They don't have a house, they don't have a car, so they can't uh, get a loan. But if reputation could be something that's permanent and shared across all the services you currently use, eBay, Airbnb, Kickstarter, whatever else, um, then this reputation surely has value to you. You don't want to lose it. And then that can be used as a collateral. Um, and I think that's an interesting way to bring the concept of chamas to the developed world. Um, other use cases with a terrible title on that slide. Uh, we have um, obviously all the organizational finance stuff you would expect. So you can, since you can build anything, you can build contracts between two peers, asset permission, shareholder agreements. You can build, whoops, prediction markets. Try not to fall. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer finance, crowdfunding, derivative, hedging, you name it. And on the consumer side, escrow, personal asset stores, and smart property, of course. Uh, one last thing before I run out of time. If the contracts are completely autonomous and independent of human control, that means that they can interact uh, with other contracts on their own. And they can represent uh, entire organization. You could say, this organization has 100 shares. These people control those shares. They get dividend from the product of the work that was done by this decentralized uh, organization. And so basically, you could build completely autonomous co-ops that are uh, on a network that's completely censorship proof and pretty much cannot be stopped. You don't have to pretty much cut off the internet for it to stop. Uh, what does it look like? It looks like this. So that's a, a proof of concept for a browser. Um, we have here your L miles that you can exchange on a decentralized exchange, which would be, say, here. Uh, you could have your derivative market. It's all like little widgets that can people, uh, people can build, and the information bubbles up back to the user. Um, you have a prediction uh, market here. I'll skip through that very quickly. Shelling Quake, that's an interesting app. If you have a prediction market where people get rewarded for correctly predicting where's the next, next earthquake, uh, you could basically build uh, the flip side of that, which is a trustless uh, earthquake insurance. You basically bet there's going to be an earthquake on your house. And if you win, well, you get the money for your house back, basically. Uh, I exaggerate, obviously, with that example, but if you think about weather derivatives, um, that's a very real thing, and that's the perfect example of, of uh, a use case for Ethereum. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, so in terms of where we're at, uh, we started in November 2013, last year. We now have three open source reference clients in C++, Go, Python. We're in proof of concept seven stage. Uh, we have a, a, a very lovely community of, uh, well, 10,000 followers on Twitter, I think, 100 page view on our website. Uh, we have 81 meetups around the world, 6,000 members, and we're growing really, really fast. Um, I'll sum up, uh, why is this important? Well, if anybody can build a business through a decentralized Kickstarter and issue shares, I think that in itself is important and it's gonna change a lot of things. Uh, universal access to financial instruments, I think that's also critical. Uh, reputation as collateral, we quickly touched on that. Um, and also, yes, this idea that those, those contracts are obviously independent of human control, potentially, and they can be shared between applications. So my reputation on Airbnb goes toward my reputation on eBay. Uh, I think that's a, that's a new concept that hasn't been done yet. So the, the question uh, for me is which vertical will be disrupted first. It's not a question of is it going to change anything. Yes, it will change something. The question is what. Um, that's it. Contact details. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter, the web, we have forums, and a chat chat. Thank you.